Hi, I'm Sharon Winsmith, a tax attorney, active investor, and your go-to resource for proven investment and tax planning strategies. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the order in which you should use good debt in order to build wealth more efficiently. We know if we want to achieve financial freedom early in life that we need to use good debt as much as possible to the extent that it makes sense and that we can do it without taking on too much risk. And anyone who tells you that wealthy people don't have debt is wrong. I've seen the tax returns of the ultra wealthy, of some of the wealthiest people in this country. They are all using good debt and they're all using quite a lot of it. I want to start with an obvious warning that not everyone should take on debt. You need to understand what you're doing. You have to be very sophisticated and savvy. You have to have the cash flow to service the debt if you're going to have to make current payments on the loan. And if it's a type of loan where you can compound the interest and the interest starts compounding on you, you have to watch out for that and be able to understand that. We know we love compounding returns. It can really help us build wealth and amass a lot of net worth that we never thought possible if we're able to start compounding our returns early enough. But that same compounding works against you when it's something like compounding interest on debt. So be careful before you take on any form of debt. Make sure you know what you're doing. Be smart and don't take on unnecessary risk. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into what I call the good debt hierarchy. So there's various different forms of good debt and a lot of the type of debt that'll be available to you will depend on what type of investments and assets you have, you know, for example, whether or not you're a business owner. But whenever you're thinking about good debt, you want to think about what are the key factors to consider. So I like to exhaust good debt based on this hierarchy. I like to start with what I think is the best form of good debt and work my way down. And it's okay to have every single form of this. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with having too much debt as long as, you know, you're smart about it. So you don't want too much debt as compared to your equity. You know, you don't want it to get out of control. But there's nothing wrong with, with having different forms of debt. And, you know, again, as long as you know what you're doing, as long as you have the, the cash flow to service the debt, then it's a great tool, if not one of the best tools to build wealth. So what do I think about when I'm considering what's the best form of debt for me to take on? The first thing, probably the most obvious is we want the cheapest form of debt. We want the lowest interest rate available. And for the most part, this hierarchy starts lowest to, to you know, what's going to be the highest rate. So that's step one. We always want, you know, the cheapest interest rate possible. Keep in mind that when you're talking about interest rates, I'm assuming that you're using this good debt to invest in something or to buy a business or to, you know, fund expansions of an existing business. I'm assuming that you're using it for investment or business purposes. If that's the case, then you should get a tax deduction for that interest. So when you're thinking about <clears throat> interest expense on good debt, make sure you think about it from an after-tax standpoint, because that can have a big difference in the interest rate that you're paying. All of these forms of debt should be able to, to give rise to a tax deduction if you're using the funds for investment or business purposes. The key is how you're using the funds. So you can borrow against your personal residence and know your residence is not an asset, it's not a business, it's just you know a personal residence. But if you use the money that you borrowed against your personal residence to fund your business, to buy a new business, to invest in you know an asset, you can get a tax deduction. The key is what you're using the borrowed money for. So always think about interest rates from an after-tax standpoint. People like to say to me at the time I'm recording this video that SBLOC interest rates are too high. Mine's a little over 6%. That's a pre-tax. After-tax, I'm happy to pay that rate all day. That is still not, you know, I think we've gotten kind of spoiled by these really low interest rates. You know, I was paying on my SBLOC below 2% at one point a year or so ago, but that's not really reflective of, you know, reality, I think, in, in long term. So you know, interest rates are very high right now. They will come down at some point, but you know, they're not always going to be one and 2% on SBLOC. So you got to be more realistic when you're thinking about that, but always think about it from an after tax standpoint. Another important thing to me is ease of attaining the loan. So I hate having to go through that loan process. I absolutely hate when they pull my credit score because it dings my credit score every time they pull it. So I know sometimes that, you know, it's not a big impact, but I, I just hate that. So, you know, when you're going for something like a business loan or SBLOC, uh, SBA loan, you know, they're going to do a hard pull of your credit score. And anyone that you're looking to, to seek, you know, get a, get a um, quote from about getting financing, they're going to pull that credit score. So, you know, getting an SBA loan is a really painful process if anyone's gone through it. 
They say that they're very hard to get. They're not that hard to get if you have good credit and you're a savvy business owner and you know, you're know you someone that makes sense to be buying a business. A lot of people aren't and a lot of people go to get SBA loans that don't have good credit or you know don't have any clue what they're doing or buying a really bad business. So if that's the case, yes, it's gonna be hard. But if you're a really good business owner, you're savvy, you know what you're doing, then SBA loans are not that hard to, to get. So don't let people tell you otherwise. Business loans, you know, these are gonna be much more difficult to obtain. It's not to say you shouldn't do it. But in SB log, I just have to go in. I have to have, you know, the requisite portfolio of securities to, you know, allow me to borrow whatever I want, you know, whatever amount I'm wanting. I have to comply with the maintenance margin requirements going forward. I have to avoid a margin call, but it's the easiest thing. Nobody's looking at my credit. Nobody's doing anything. Um, you know, you're just, you're able to borrow, but that can also get you in a lot of trouble because nobody's really kind of checking behind you to make sure it's a smart loan. But Big fan of SB locks for really savvy investors that know what they're doing. If you don't know what SB locks are, I have a lot of videos on that. You have to understand that. That's, a, I think, one of the best wealth building tools. So, you know, mortgages, HELOCs are a little bit easier to get, but interest rates are usually a little bit higher and you don't get as long a term. So that's why we have mortgage second. But, you know, ease of obtaining a loan, you know, SB lock could not be any easier to, to get a loan. Term of loan, you want as long as possible. Obviously, you know, I, I like to, to not have to pay it back, you know, as long as it's a form of good debt with a decent interest rate, you don't want to pay that off. Contrary to what Dave Ramsey says, you do not want to pay off good debt any faster than you need to. You want to pay that off, you know, low interest rate debt as slow as possible. I think one of the most risky, dangerous things people do is pay down low interest rate debt and in high inflationary environments like we're in right now faster than they need to. That's crazy to me. I don't understand how you can be able to borrow, you know, and get debt at all with having such a little understanding of finance and how it works and opportunity costs, but you never want to pay off low interest rate debt, for, you know, quicker than possible. So I like as long a term alone as possible. I'll talk to you more about that in the context of my hierarchy in just a minute. Volatility of collateral, got to be careful here. You know, things with SB lock where you're borrowing against, you know, your, your stock portfolio. Yes, it's very volatile. Yes, it can go down. Yes, you can have a margin call, you know, if you don't prepare properly. So you got to watch out for that. Um, you know, borrowing against real estate is, some would say, a lot less risky because real estate isn't, they say it's not quite as volatile. It's just you don't see the price movements as much. So, you know, real estate might be a little bit less volatile. So to the extent you can think about that, you know, something like a business loan, your business is going to be a lot more volatile probably than real estate, even if you don't know you know, necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis, what's happening to the value of your business or your property. But you got to think about that. You know, that that's kind of the last factor I like to think about with all else equal. So with these key factors in mind, let's just run through my hierarchy. I want to explain to you why I have it, you know, in, in this in this order. So SB locks are usually the lowest interest rates possible. They're, they're generally competitive with mortgages. Mine have always been lower. If you know where to shop around and get the best rates, which you absolutely should do, don't do an SB lock with your Schwab account, you know, don't use these big banks. You shouldn't be using those anyway. They're terrible. But, you know, you got to shop around for SB locks. You got to use banks that are really more where smart people are, you know, are, are doing this and, and using, putting their portfolio in order to get an SB lock. So SB locks are my favorite. It's the lowest interest rates almost always. Like I said, it's the easiest. You, you don't have to go through any process to get approved. And yes, I think that's very risky because there's a lot of people who, you know, do SB locks that absolutely should not be doing them. But so, you know, ease of obtaining a loan, which is good for people like us who know what we're doing. And term of the loan, SB locks are indefinite. You know, as long as you're meeting the maintenance margin requirements and, you know, you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay interest or principal repayments on a current basis. You can kind of just accrue that and let, you know, let that outstanding. But you got to watch out for the compounding. It's usually daily accruals. So you got to watch out for that. You got to make sure that what you're using the funds from the SB lock for is well, you know, getting returns well in excess of whatever your compounding interest rate is. So you got to watch out for that. But it, the, the term of the loan is indefinite. I plan to have my SB lock for the rest of my life. I'm not paying that 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 off. Volatility of collateral. That's the one thing about SB locks. Yes, yeah, stock market goes up and it goes down. It's all over the place. So you know, got to watch out for that. That's the one negative factor with an SB lock. But I'm willing to stomach that because. You know, you're only borrowing, you're only allowed to usually borrow up to 50% of your portfolio. I don't usually go up to the 50%. I never, you know, have 50% outstanding at any given time. And if I was, it would certainly not be based on evaluation of my portfolio in a high market. So got to watch out for that. That's the one thing to watch out for with SB locks. But I still think it's the best form of good debt to use. And I exhaust my SB lock before I go to anything else. So full disclosure, I do not own a home. I am very anti home ownership. I think people should rent as long as possible. I live in New York City. So it's, very easy for me to do and it makes my life a lot more easy. But <clears throat> yes, your home is not an asset. But if you do have a home, 
mortgages I think are great. I think having as big a mortgage as you can possibly have, you know, that's smart that you can pay for and not too risky, as well as HELOCs, home equity lines of credit are great. This also applies to rental properties. So if you've got rental properties, I would mortgage the heck out of those, you know, get more people do cash out refis, for example, and then go buy the next property. So that's the way you really do real estate investing to maximize your return. So when I say mortgage, I'm talking about personal residence and your rental properties. I like a mortgage better than a HELOC because interest rates are typically lower. The ease of obtaining the loan, yes, a mortgage is a much more involved process. There's a lot of costs with it and that kind of thing. A home equity, you know, a HELOC is pretty easy to get if you, you know, got good credit and whatnot. But, you know, always go for that lowest interest rate possible and the term of the loan. The mortgage, you should be getting a 30 year. You know, you want that term as long as possible. It's good debt, so you're happy to have it for as long as possible. You don't want to pay it off any faster than you have to. Volatility of collateral, I'm pretty happy here. You know, we know home values don't change that much. Usually, yes, we've seen some some bad real estate, you know, markets that have would say otherwise, but you know, it's not not real estate is typically not thought to be too volatile. So moving on to SBA loans and business loans, these are kind of the same in, in some respects. So when you're thinking about an SBA loan, you are thinking about when you're buying a business. So that's typically the only way or you know, the easiest way to get an SBA loan is to help you buy the business. Big fan of exhausting that, you know, as much as possible that you can. And, you know, it's gonna have a, it should have a lower interest rate than a business loan. Business loan is like you're going to, to a bank and you're getting a business loan from the bank that's not, you know, backed by the SBA. So it's, you know, if you can't get an SBA loan or a lot of banks will try to push you to business loans, be careful with that. Don't let them push you to the business loan. You want to start with SBA SBA loans. Um, you know, as long a term as possible, they're usually pretty comparable, but SBA you can sometimes get longer terms. Ease of obtaining the loan, you know, these are all, the, both. neither one of these is easy. You're gonna have to go through a really annoying process where you have to, you know, put together this portfolio, do all this analysis, give them this, you know, report that you've done all your work. So it's not the easiest. So that's why it's always gonna be lower than these. And the interest rates are always gonna be higher than, than these are, unless you've just got, you know, some bad credit or something. Volatility of collateral. You know, businesses aren't typically that volatile, depending on what your business is. It's kind of similar to real estate. You're not going to see those price resets that often. So, you know, not super volatile, but a business can change in valuation. You know, you just don't necessarily follow it or track it on a very frequent basis. So this is my hierarchy of good debt. I start here. I would work my way down. Mortgage HELOCs, you know, uh, when I'm talking about mortgage, I'm talking about home you can always borrow against your personal residence, usually at a lower rate than a rental property. So I would start there. Then every rental property I have, I mortgage them, you know, as much as I can. So this is, I think, a good rule of thumb of where to start and work your way down. If you do have a whole life insurance policy, so I am not a fan of these policies. I think they were really popular a few years ago. And then once people like me started really diving in and lawyers like, like myself started reading these contracts and realizing that people selling them had no clue how they worked and usually didn't even have them themselves that, you know, a lot of these are junk. And, and I think, you know, I would dare say most of them are scams. If you do have one, the whole concept of them is that you borrow against them, you know, kind of like very similar to like the be your own bank strategy where you've got your whole life insurance policy and you borrow against the cash value of the policy. Let's say you already have one in place. I would, you know, consider using that. You can usually get very low cost of interest, you know, that you're borrowing it. Keep in mind, as you borrow against the cash value, you're draining out the death benefit. So if you were to die, while that loan is outstanding, yes, you're reducing the money that's paid to your, you know, whoever the beneficiaries of that policy are. I would not recommend going out and getting a policy. Um, I'm pretty anti whole life insurance for the most part. I think the vast majority of the policies should not even be able to be sold. But if you do already have a policy in place, that's definitely a place I would look to, to borrow as well as a form of good debt. So this was just my overview of my hierarchy. Again, don't listen to anyone who tells you that wealthy people don't have debt. They very much do. The smartest people I know have probably the most forms of good debt out there. Got to be careful. Don't do anything stupid. Don't take on debt that, that's going to give rise to unnecessary risk. Don't borrow against something that's not you know stable and that could get yourself in trouble. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please like the video and subscribe to the channel.